Okay, so we are in module 14. Okay, it's 215. And here I forgot to mute the, uh, YouTube. Anywho, we are two modules away from the end. So this will be the second to last uh, lecture that we will have. Next week will be the final lecture. The week after that is when the final and all assignments are due. So if you have been watching on Discord, I have been putting up that, that countdown of how many days are left until the due until date. Here is the picture of the week. This week, we're starting to get away from the technical and really start to look at things from the business perspective. For example, all businesses, regardless of their size, must have a strategic plan to provide alternative modes of operation when an interruption could result in a significant loss to the enterprise. A business continuity plan consists of recovery planning, crisis management, and communication, and disaster recovery. This picture is a business impact analysis. The BIA identifies business functions and quantifies the impact of a loss on these functions may have on business operations. These impacts can range from property, finance, safety, reputation, and life impacts. This she or this example sheet helps determine the mission essential function, identify critical systems and single point of failures for a business. They can also contain privacy impact assessment and privacy threshold assessments. Because remember, it's what we do isn't just limited to technology. The, the topics that we bring to the table for a company, the assurances, the thoughts we bring are more than just the computers. Because the computers are useless if there's, if there's a power outage. That's not, that's not the job of somebody else to figure out. That's part of us to figure out what happens when there's a power outage. A disaster recovery plan is a comprehensive plan involving restoring the IT functions and services to their former state. This should be written, updated, and tested periodically to ensure its success when the time comes. A typical outline has five points to it. It has the purpose and scope, the recovery team, so the purpose and scope is the introduction, objectives, any constraints, assumptions, incidents that would require a, a action, contingencies, any physical safeguards, that kind of stuff, insurance. The recovery team is uh, who is going to be part of this, uh, this team, like where's the headquarters, who's the coordinator, who are the team leaders and their responsibilities. Uh, there's a section for preparing for a disaster, such as the, the physical risks, the digital risks, environmental, internal, external, and all of their safeguards. The emergency procedures, because a disaster will occur. It's not a when, it's an if. So how does the team form? The list of the vendors that need to get contacted. Uh, the use of alternate sites and offsite storage and the restoration procedures. What is the recovery plan for the central facilities? What is the system and operations, the scope of limited operations at the central site, any network communications and uh, clients? Other topics that exist in DR plans are the order of restoration, because maybe the user's workstation is not highest priority. Maybe it's the Active Directory server or maybe it's the file server. 
uh, alternative business practices, alternate processing sites, and failover. As with these, uh, you must test over and over. You must, must, must do testing exercises to show the effectiveness of the plan, either in tabletop, dry runs, or other means. You do not want to make a plan and not test it periodically to see that it does work. Now, fault tolerance can be achieved through a number of ways. For example, fault tolerance, ensuring that whatever system, server, function is still working, even if part of the infrastructure goes down. Uh, one way is servers, because servers play a vital role in network infrastructure. The loss of a single one could have significant impact. And a way to minimize the risk is by having spare parts or a second server identical to the first. Another way is to have a series of servers grouped together in a cluster so that if a single unit fails, the entire system continues to work transparent to the user. Storage uses RAID, the uh, redundant array of uh, independent disks. All storage drives, no matter what they are, whether it's a spinning disk or a solid state or a hybrid, they all have a mean time between failure. The amount of time until a component fails cannot be repaired and must be replaced. Calculating this will help the business estimate how much it will spend in storage and how often drives will fail. Uh, RAID provides a means to ensure data is safe and accessible when a drive fails. And here is an example of the major RAID levels. Kind of a review of um, A+. Uh, networks, just as servers are important, devices that connect our network need redundancy, like a spare device or a separate connection should one fail using things like load balancers or two different internet connections from different vendors. Power, as I mentioned before, is essential when planning redundancy. Installing proper uninterruptible power supplies uh, will help when there's an interruption from the primary source. UPSs are short for great for a uh, short term within 10 minutes. If a pow if power goes out for longer than that, then you should probably have a backup generator, either powered by like diesel, natural gas, or propane in order to continue operations should and when power go out. There's also recovery sites. Entire sites may need to be planned should something happen to the primary site, such as fire, flood, even meteor. There are three different kinds of sites. There is the hot site, is essentially a duplicate of the production site and has all the equipment needed for an organization to continue running, including office space, furniture, computers, backups, internet for immediate use. A warm site has all the equipment installed but doesn't have active internet or telecom facilities or current backups. It's cheaper than hot and can be ready within half a day or more. A cold site provides office space, but there is no equipment, furniture, or anything else ready. Uh, data backup. Knowing your recovery point objective and your recovery time objective will help you in calculate when backups should be performed. And we have different kinds of backups. We have the full backup. It's the basic backup option, which all the selected files and folders are backed up. Multiple full backups cause huge resource utilization. They are the fastest and simplest backup to restore data from. This is good 
for a small amount of data. Incremental, data only, uh, only the data modified after the previous backup is archived. This backup is very fast as it only copies modified files, but while restoring, it's quite slow as all the incremental backups need to be checked for restoring the, the latest data. This approach is good for a large amount of files as it will back them. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I was right. This approach is, is good for a large amount of files as it will back them up quickly and take lesser space as compared to multiple full backups. The differential backup uh, includes archiving of modified files like incremental backup. It shortens the restoring time compared with inter incremental backup. Doing many differential backups consumes huge space that may exceed the basic full backup size. And then there's also uh, the offsite or, uh, or mirror backup, live sync of the data. In this process, data is stored and synced on multiple locations at the same time. Easier to do on the cloud than it is in person. Now there are also some environmental controls that we have to think about. For example, fire suppression is something that needs to be considered. Uh, an internal electrical fire is a risk that we must prevent and mitigate. It is recommended that wherever you have your, um, your main data center, whenever, wherever you have your servers, to have some sort of stationary fire suppression system. This video is one example from a vendor. The heart of an organization beats not in an office, but here in the data center. Thousands of servers processing vital information for all your accounts, storing all your essential business data. These servers are designed for punishing 24-7 operations and they demand the most robust fire protection solutions available. The sprinkler systems required by building codes are designed to protect structures and people, not data center equipment. Protecting critical infrastructure such as a data center takes a KIDA fire detection and suppression system. KIDA systems detect the earliest stages of a fire then extinguish it in seconds by discharging a clean suppression agent. That's safer for humans and the environment without the water damage caused by sprinklers. To demonstrate the difference, we've replicated a data center in this fire testing facility. Typically, a data center fire would start inside one of these server cabinets. This type of enclosed fire is tough to extinguish using sprinklers alone, but it's an ideal situation for clean agent fire suppression systems. The room is equipped with KIDA air sampling and spot smoke sensors, plus the clean agent fire suppression system and nine water sprinklers. When everything is ready, the clean agent test is run first. Engineers ignite sheets of ABS plastic in an empty server cabinet. The air sampling and spot smoke sensors alert the system. And then, discharge. The Novec 1230 suppression agent floods the room and penetrates the burning enclosure where it extinguishes the fire in less than 20 seconds. The water sprinkler test begins the same way but nearly four minutes elapse before the first sprinkler head discharges. Seven minutes later, the fire is still burning. Fifteen minutes after ignition, a firefighter enters the test chamber and puts out the fire with a portable fire CO2 fire extinguisher. 
The sprinklers did their job preventing the fire from involving the entire room. But the server equipment, walls, and ceiling are all water damaged. The results of the Kitta Clean Agent System test are dramatically different. Even though the cabinet temperature reached 230 degrees Fahrenheit before the agent discharged, the room and servers show virtually no sign of damage. From the perspective of IT operations and data security, it's as if the fire in the data center never happened. I mean, that's just one example of a vendor. Uh, here's another example of electromagnetic disruption protection. Since all electrical devices emit electromagnetic fields, which can interfere with other devices or can be captured by attackers, uh, there is a way to install Faraday cages around your data center to prevent uh, data from getting captured or interfered with in your data center if you're dealing with highly sensitive information. Again, just examples of vendors that provide the, these protections. Uh, before I move on to digital forensics, can't forget to mention HVAC. Having proper cooling for data centers is critical. Setting up the proper airflow, the proper flow and ventilation will ensure that devices will work without issue and also will extend the life of your infrastructure. Because as, as we all know, uh, heat, wear, and tear are, are the pretty big factors in, um, you know, in shortening the lifespan of our devices. And right now with the chip shortage happening, you really want to ensure that your devices last until the shortage is over and you are able to replace your devices. Now moving on to the last uh, subject for this chapter is digital forensics. 
Security Plus does not go deep into digital forensics. It, it uh, covers it very briefly. So you should see a few questions on it, but nothing, nothing in depth. This subject though is covered in depth in my CIS 77, the digital forensics class. So incident response is a plan of written instructions for reacting to a security incident. A typical incident response plan consists of preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. As with disaster recovery plans, this should be tested and updated to ensure everything and everyone is ready for an incident. Digital forensics is a little different. Uh, it is more invasive than incident response. With digital forensics, you want to secure the crime scene, performing damage control, neutralizing the suspected perpetrator, reporting the incident to authorities, quarantining in the electronic equipment, preserving the evidence by capturing system images, any network traffic and other relevant information, then making mirror copies for a use in analysis. There's a establishing the chain of custody, documenting all devices and personnel who handle the evidence for what length of time, examining the evidence, searching through that mirror image for clues that relate to the incident, such as deleted files or data transferred, and enabling recovery, recovering from the event and building lessons learned. Any questions on this week's topics? All right, seeing none, I'll stop this recording.